trains, rails, locomotion. If that ain't enough to get the typical cardboard slinger salivating, I don't know what will. And now Dan Keltner and Seth Jaffe's 2014 modern classic Isle of Trains is getting a new edition, all aboard. Players build trains to efficiently carry cargo and passengers to the six locations on the island, claiming the location's contracts and reaping boons for dropping the charming wooden passengers to their corresponding color-coded destinations. Most of the action in the game happens with your multi-use train cards. You can add new trains to your trains, which are also paid for by discarding trains, and your new trains frequently have capacity for one of the game's three resources, which are also on the train cards in hand. But the quarter loop really comes down to acquiring new passengers and train cards, building a train that has both the weight to hold the number of cars you need and capacity to hold the right cargo, loading the aforementioned passengers and train cards as cargo, then making deliveries to locations, ideally completing multiple deliveries to the same location in one fell swoop. But flying in the face of all that's implied by rails, transportation, and even the visual design of the island, this is not a game of proximity, this is a game of actions. There is no board, there are no routes, even the map in the middle of the table is a collection of contracts that when delivered are claimed by the player, pushing the game closer to the final round, though visitors can still be delivered to those locations. This game is all about using your two actions each turn to pivot one thing into the next as as efficiently as possible, which is where there's a bit of a twist to the game. The majority of the trains have capacity for a specific resource or a passenger, but also have a bonus effect if loaded by another player. Sure, you could spend a precious action to draw a single card, or you could load a coal into your neighbor's train, which yes, they could use for a delivery, but in exchange, maybe you draw several cards and then even take a bonus build or delivery action. But the juiciest and most tempting trains, not to mention those with the highest capacity to complete the elusive but more potent secondary contract deliveries are higher level versions of the various cars with suitably high level costs. But Isle of Trains has your back because cars can either be built for their full cost or upgraded by discarding an already built car of the same type and paying the difference. In such a small structure, opportunity cost is abound. Then, unless playing solo, where the game is driven by emptying the deck or fulfilling a scenario-based win condition, which is actually a really cool puzzly approach to solo games that I'd like to see more of, the progress track pushes forward with surprising momentum as standard contracts are claimed and visitor hubs are filled, leading to a final round after which players count up points and determine the winner of the game. Okay, so the thing that was most distinct as soon as I had played this game, the thing that popped out the most was the implementation of multi-use cards. Something that I love anytime I see it. It's just delightful to me, the practicality, the utility of cards that can be the, the inciting point for so many different decisions. And this game does not disappoint. In fact, this is some of the most multi-usefulness of multi-use cards that I've seen to date. Not only are they the physical manifestation of your train on the table, they're the abilities that you have. They're the ongoing passive traits that are applying to your trains. They are the, the physical resource that you're slotting into your train as the cargo. They're the money that you are spending in order to purchase the very same cards to put into play. And what this allows you to do is have a lot of different avenues for interaction in this game that are born out of one singular resource so you can do a lot with a little. It's a great way of making a game feel robust even if it's in this kind of diminutive shell. And once you grog your head around those multi-use cards, the game itself becomes really snappy with these important but relatively easy to make decisions because you have to focus down to the two things that you want to do on this turn and maybe setting up what you're going to do on the next turn. So the game has this really snappy momentum, though it does verge on abrupt if you're the type of person that wants to build an engine and actually see it in action. I mean, your literal train engine that you're building is going to look stupendous, 
but if you're not employing it, the game is going to be over before you know it. So less than thinking about this as an engine building game, it's more of an efficiency game. And in that lies the most satisfying aspect of the game. I really love it when you can chain together things in concert so that you can make a delivery for one or multiple things at the same time at the same location, claiming the primary contract, maybe fulfilling the secondary contract, and also dropping off a visitor to that same place feels like you just orchestrated the biggest master plan of all time, even if it was just a sequence of a few actions smartly strung together. And the last real highlight that I, I would put as a focus on this game is just the vibrance, the aesthetic, the look on the table. Initially, when I was looking at this box, I, I thought, you know, okay, that, that looks like a relatively inoffensive pleasant game but i found that the look of the the world built upon the table turned out to be something that was really inviting and had this tonal poppiness that mirrors the poppiness of the gameplay itself but while we're talking about presentation let's flip to some of the criticisms of the game too as much as I like multi-use cards, which believe me is a lot, I love multi-use cards. I think the visual presentation of the train cards was too busy for me. Having this disjointed link between the picture of the train, what resource it is if it's used as cargo, the specific capacity that it has, and the fact that it lists an ability, it makes the cards themselves visually cluttered and kind of hard to read. And I just mentioned how other players access your abilities. The abilities on the trains that you put out, aside from the passive abilities on the cabooses, the caboose eye, the caboose Kabusa news. <laughs> Aside from those passive abilities, you only get the ability of someone else's train if you generously slot cargo into there, which is cool in theory, but I found a practice that was rarely as good feeling as you really want it to be. If I see that someone else is going to be able to make this awesome delivery, if I give them a coal or I give them an oil, then yeah, I might get some cards out of it, but I'd rather just selfishly work towards my own goals. That's not to say that I never used other players' abilities. You end up having to. It just didn't feel like it was as satisfying and cohesively baked into the game as the intended experience wanted it to be. But once you get over that hump and you wrap your brain around the multitudes of uses of the multi-use cards, then it comes together quite well and becomes quite a cohesive little game. I was surprised that for its size, this is a full-fledged, albeit quick playing, train game so while it doesn't pull it off entirely seamlessly, I Love Trains All Aboard more than justifies this new release. And that's our review. But let us know, what are some games that didn't make the biggest splash in the world that you'd like to see new editions of? And what are some of the improvements that you'd like to see in new editions of that game? And as always, thanks for watching, thanks for supporting, thanks for being an awesome community. You know that I have been Jack for the Cardboard. Harold.